Okay, hopefully everybody's into the session. Welcome everybody to the annual Don Paul Memorial Lecture for 2021, Innovation in Conservation. This event is brought to you by Trust for Nature with the support of the Paul Family Foundation. My name is Nikki Munro and I work for Trust for Nature in Northeast Victoria and I will be your host for tonight. This year, we're exploring the topic of fenced reserves and their role in, in the conservation of our most threatened species. This is a topic I'm very interested in and have been for a long time, and I hope it's caught your attention too. Before we commence, I would first like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the country that we are all zooming in from today. Since we are joining from all over the country, well, perhaps it would be a good idea for each person to quietly acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which you live and work. Tonight, I am dialing in from the country of the Yorta Yorta and Bauruan, and I pay my respects to the traditional owners of the country, past, present and emerging, and I thank them in particular for their involvement in land conservation. This evening's lecture is brought to you by Trust for Nature. Trust for Nature is one of Australia's oldest conservation organisations established in 1972. Our core business is working with willing landholders to establish permanent protection on areas of very important native ecosystems on private land. This work creates a lasting legacy for future generations. This annual lecture series was established to acknowledge the impact of John Paul and his family. John was the former director of Docker Plains Pastoral Company, who sadly passed away in 2015. John Paul worked with Trust for Nature to establish Victoria's largest conservation covenant at a huge 1,100 hectares on the family property at Docker Plains near Wangaratta. That's actually just down the road from where I'm talking to you today. And this property is an outstanding example of balancing the protection for biodiversity with active farming. John was also a passionate supporter of traditional owners and his foundation gives ongoing support to the local Bangaran community. So thank you very much to Mary and the Paul family for this lecture tonight. So over the next hour, we, and a bit, we will hear from each of our guest speakers there will be time for a bit of a panel discussion at the end, or at least answering a few questions. If you have any questions, please pop them into the Q&A section of your screen, and our panelists will answer some of these ongoing through the night, as well as some of our Trust for Nature staff, and we'll save one or two of the questions for the end. Before I introduce our guest speakers, I want to give you just a little bit of background. As you may know, Australia has a very poor record of recent animal extinctions, and much of this can be blamed on introduced cats and foxes, predating on our, local, on our native wildlife, and rabbits eating our local plants, and changing vegetation structure. The mammals, particularly the ground-dwelling mammals between sort of rat size and rabbit size, are the most impacted by predation and competition. So what can we do? Well, eradication across Australia is almost impossible at the moment, except on quite small islands. But we can create small islands on the mainland where we establish fence reserves, remove all the feral animals from inside and replace them with native wildlife that used to occur there. This is a relatively recent strategy stimulated by our appalling mammal decline and extinction. But Australia now leads the way internationally on designing and managing such reserves with over 30 fenced reserves currently in operation. Fenced reserves may be the only current viable option for protecting some of our most threatened species, but they aren't without challenges. So now let's hear from our guest speakers on fenced reserves and how far conservation can go. So I would now like to welcome the speakers for tonight's lecture. All are leaders in their field 
who have well who have worked to find practical solutions to real world problems. I first welcome Catherine Mosby, who I had the privilege to work with in Roxby Downs in at Arid Recovery. Since she's established Arid Recovery, she's gone on to found several other projects, um, all based on conservation of threatened species, mostly in the deserts. So Catherine is a wealth of knowledge of desert ecology and has been at the leading edge of threatened species conservation since the mid 90s. Catherine has roles in both the Adelaide University and the University of New South Wales, and with her husband, John Reid, has um, her own consultancy, Ecological Horizons. Welcome, Catherine, over to you. Thanks, Nikki. Um, I'm just gonna try and share my screen and hopefully see if that works. Uh, nope, that's not the right one. Uh, here we go. Great. So I'll just put it on slideshow. Oh, why is it doing that? Sorry, hold on a second. Technical glitch. Just got to try and put it back to where we started. Oh, it's good to go first, isn't it? Just trying to get the share screen bit. Okay, I don't understand why it won't go full screen. There it is. Okay, sorry about that. Um, good evening. Uh, so I want to talk today about fence conservation reserves and a little bit about the good, the bad and the ugly because there's certainly some interesting aspects of fence reserves. So I'll get straight into it. Why do we need them? Um, you know, they're, they're pretty expensive. They're a lot of time and effort to put up. You know, how, how come we need them at all? Can we just live without fence reserves? And when you look at the history of reintroductions in Australia, apart from islands, uh, we've got a very poor history of reintroduction success outside fence reserves. So a lot of, a litany of failed reintroductions and a, a wide range of these critical weight range species. So they, they're just not really working. We keep trying to reintroduce them outside fences and uh, certainly in our arid zones, they're, they're really not surviving. And the main reason for this is, uh, well, there's a few reasons, but at least where I work in the deserts, that foxes and cats are major predators, rabbits and overgrazing. And obviously further south, that would be land clearance. So these sort of are really stopping animals from being reintroduced outside fence reserves. There has been some success um, outside fence reserves using aerial poison baiting. So Western Australia in particular, the Flinders Ranges in South Australia, um, but they've had to implement sort of poison baiting of 1080 over large areas. And in South Australia and Western Australia, a lot of our animals have high tolerance um, compared to the Eastern states where the tolerance is a lot lower. So we have had some success with that in those areas. So fence reserves, I think John Wamsley was one of the first ones to do Warrawong Sanctuary, which was one of the earliest fence reserves in South Australia in the Adelaide Hills. And um, since then, they've sort of sprung up all over the place and um, we've got more than 25 of them. Uh, they're all over different habitat types. It's quite a few in WA, but they are certainly in a lot of places throughout Australia. Um, none that I know of in Tasmania, but that, this is quite a few years old, so it might have come on since then. So we've got over 25 of them. It's, it's going up all the time, certainly has skyrocketed in the last five years and there's more planned in New South Wales um, over the next few years as well. They only cover a few, square kilo, a few hundred square kilometres though, and most of them are very small. So the median size is only 4.2 square kilometres. So they're, they're pretty small little postage stamps in a wide area of, of habitat. Not just confined to Australia, we find them in a whole lot of other countries. This is a mongoose fence in Japan that was um, erected to protect the Okinawa rail, which is a very threatened bird over there. So they're, they're certainly used in a lot of other countries as well, not just Australia. And the fence reserves we have in Australia can sort of be divided up into three groups. We've got the, the single species emergency intervention type fence reserves, and they tend to be for you know, critically endangered or, or single species focus. Then we've got the multiple species one where we put lots of different species in and, and try and get the numbers up you know, as high as we can. And then there's more sort of ecosystem focused 
ones where we're trying to restore the whole ecosystem and, and re-establish those natural ecosystem processes. So we sort of see different exclosures in different categories throughout Australia. But I guess in a lot of cases, we see them as stepping stones. So you might start off with these insurance populations in zoos or islands, and then we move them into these sort of fenced reserves. But the ultimate aim, I guess, is to get them outside those fence reserves and into managed landscapes and get that, that widespread recovery happening. So sort of see them as a stepping stone to, to wider spread recovery. So the good, the bad and the ugly, I'll start off with the good. Um, and there's plenty of good with fence reserves, uh, otherwise we wouldn't keep building them. So obviously they work. Um, if we look at the reintroduction success of small mammals and medium-sized mammals into fence reserves, they're extremely successful. The ones that have failed have tended to fail through native predators, so things like aerial predators or pythons, that, goannas, those sort of things. But in general, you fence an area, you exclude cats and foxes, and you reintroduce animals, and they, they, they start increasing pretty well straight away. So they definitely work from that perspective. So we co-founded Arid Recovery in 1997, which is one of the larger fence reserves in Australia. It's 123 square kilometres. It's got six compartments and we move animals between compartments and do some experimental reintroductions with different aspects of it as well. Um, and so it's been going for over 20 years now. It's probably one of the longer running exclosures in Australia. And the reason we started uh, Arid Recovery was uh, when rabbit Khaleesi virus came through. I don't know if anyone remembers in about 995, it was it escaped from Wardang Island and spread across Australia and we had a massive reduction in, in rabbits. And that really was our stimulus to, to fence off an area and try and permanently remove rabbits and cats and foxes from that area. And we had a great window of opportunity with the, with the RCD coming through. And since that time, we have reintroduced five threatened species. So the sick nest rat, the Western Bar Bandicoot, Bilby, Burrowing Betong and Western Quoll. Some of these like the Shark Bay Bandicoot and the Burrowing Betong are only found on offshore islands in Western Australia. Western Quoll has declined by more than 90% of its range and stick nest rat is only found on one island off South Australia. So these are very threatened species and we re released them and their numbers increased inside the reserve. We also tried to release numbats and wombat pythons um, but both of those releases failed due to predation from native predators. So not only are we seeing differences in terms of animals being in the environment, we're also changing the whole soundscape. So this is a growing betong, and when you walk around the reserve now, when you startle them, they make, they make this noise. It's, a, it's an alarm call. I'll play it again in case we missed it. Um, so... <laughs> It's quite an interesting call to hear at night. And then the other noise we often hear with the betongs, they do a lot of fighting between themselves. We get this sort of um, aggression noise. It's like a hissing noise. So they're, you know, they're changing the whole landscape. We, we're certainly getting a lot of changes happening. It's not just the physical animals, but, and things like um, the bilbies that we've reintroduced, they're doing a lot of digging. This one's digging for ant larvae. And those foraging pits uh, provide seed germination sites and just um, increase the water infiltration and the carbon in the soil. So we're seeing a whole lot of ecosystem changes from releasing these animals. It's not just the ecosystem. Uh, it's not just the animals themselves. Another, I guess, one of the goods of, of fence reserves is it really can help improve our understanding. So a lot of fence reserves do monitoring inside and outside. They're getting a whole understanding of how the ecosystem used to work when these animals were in it. And um, that knowledge can then be applied outside the reserve at, at, other, at other sites. So that's been a, a real key thing that we've done at Arid Recovery. We've done a lot of fauna and flora monitoring. Uh, and some reserves, not all reserves are open to the public, but if you, if you can, they've got, they're a fantastic opportunity for education and public participation. People just love coming out, spotlighting at night or being involved in releasing animals. And it's a really great way to get people back to nature and, and interacting with nature. And there's such few opportunities to do that these days. So fence reserves really play a really important role in that. So not just from conservation, but from, from education. And Arid Recovery's had thousands of groups come through. And I think that photo on the right is from Mulligan's Flat. So um, it's a bit too cold there to be Arid Recovery. So yeah, certainly happens at other fence set reserves as well. 
training and inspiring. We we have a lot of school groups. We have we've had over fifty um, PhD honors and master students come and do research there. People go on and then get jobs in a whole range of other organisations across Australia. So it's a great stepping stone for training ecologists and, and training young Australians. So fence reserves can really provide that opportunity, which uh, as an outdoor laboratory, which you know they're, they're hard to come by. Recovery does pride itself on doing a lot of research. So we've collaborated with 76 organisations, including 23 universities and published a whole lot of publications. So fence reserves do give that opportunity to, to do research and, as well as just conservation. And some of that research can be really beneficial. So this is a stick nest wrap that was reintroduced to Arid Recovery. They build these amazing nests out of sticks. And just from researching them, we found that over the summer months when it gets really hot here, they, they migrate and retreat to, to Betong Warrens in the summer. So we now know that when you release these rats, we really need to have a co-release of some sort of burrowing animal in order to provide them with that thermal refuge that they need over the summer months. So this is pretty pretty important research that can get done in fenced reserves. So the bad, it's not really bad, it's, it's more like just things to watch out for rather than necessarily being bad in particular. Um, very expensive. Fenced reserves can cost anywhere from you know 30,000 a kilometre up to 240,000 a kilometre depending on the design. Um, so you could easily spend a million dollars on building it, removing pests and reintroducing species. So they're, they're very expensive. And I think the thing that, that people don't realise is the maintenance and replacement costs. At Arid Recovery, we have to replace our foot netting every 15 years because it gets um, it gets rusted out by touching the sand, which is highly corrosive. So we've got a huge amount of money that we have to spend every 15 years in replacement and then even maintenance every year. Um, things happen, sand builds up on the fence, you get holes under the fence. So it is a constant, it's a really big job and it's, it requires a really high level of commitment. Fences are a barrier to cats and foxes, which is great, but they're also a barrier to a whole lot of other species as well. So they stop kangaroos and emus moving through the landscape. We get bird strike and reptile death from entanglement. Um, they prevent natural dispersal of animals inside and animals outside. So, you know, when you're thinking about a fence reserve, you really have to think about the impacts it might have on the in situ species and, and how you might be able to reduce them because there are definitely some of those negative consequences of, of putting a, a barrier up to a lot of species. Naivety, so you take away predators and you release animals that then don't have any exposure to predators and you end up with very naive animals that are not going to cope well when you want to release them outside reserves or they're not going to cope well um, in other natural situations. So you have to be very careful in fence reserves that you don't just perpetuate and exacerbate prey naivety, which is due to that lack of co-evolution between these species and, and cats and foxes. So certainly something to be aware of trying to have predators in the system. Inbreeding and loss of genetic diversity. Um, the smaller the reserve and the smaller the effective population size, the greater the risk of inbreeding and, and um, losing your yeah, heterozygosity. So it's yeah definitely an issue with fence reserves and, and we need to look at doing genetic swaps. We've just recently done some adding new genetics for our bilbies, but it's a, a constant issue that you need to be on top of and, and be monitoring and, and implementing unless you have a, a very large reserve. I think something that maybe people don't often realise is that some species don't benefit from fence reserves. So we measured a whole lot of in situ species, so little native rodents and little native reptiles inside and outside our reserve. And on the left there is the inside and the dotted line is the fence. And a lot of these animals are, are more abundant outside the reserve than inside the reserve. And this could be because, you know, the, some of the reintroduced species like the bilbies are eating them. It can also be what we call trophic cascades. So when we got rid of the cats and foxes, the goanna numbers increased and goannas love to eat small reptiles. So that's also had a, an effect. So, you know, you build a fence, but not necessarily every species is going to benefit from that. So something worth thinking about before you put the fence up. And then we come to the ugly. So this is more ugly as in not ugly animals, but ugly situations. And one of those is overpopulation. So this is when you get too much of a good thing. And we've got an example here, arid recovery with our burrowing betong. 
where the numbers have increased to proportions where they damage the vegetation. So you remove, remove predators and animals thrive. We went from 30 bedongs to over 6,000 in 16 years. And that number just started having a huge impact, browsing impact on our native vegetation. These trees on the left are native plums, which is a, a beautiful grove species that's really drought tolerant, um, completely defoliated by bedongs. And you can see as the bedong abundance went up, the vegetation damage also increased. So it became a real problem as to what to do with all these animals. And it doesn't just happen in Australia, it happens all over the world. This is an example of a fenced reserve in the Netherlands where they introduced a whole lot of large herbivores and let the numbers build up and they had a mass starvation event, um, which is obviously an animal welfare issue um, in such a small reserve. So one of the things we're trying to do is add native predators to see if we can control all these bedongs. Um, you think a quoll might not be big enough for a bedong, but these are quite formidable predators and they certainly eat bedongs. Um, but again, when you introduce a predator, you need a large area to support a large number of predators. I guess the other ugly situation with fence reserves or muddy situation is this halo effect. So this is the the thinking that you animals build up inside the reserve and then they self-release outside and then you end up with a, a beautiful halo around your fence reserve where the, the animals are surviving outside. Well, we actually tested this arid recovery with our threatened species. So most of them can get out either as juveniles or they can climb over the fence. And we didn't have a halo for any of the reintroduced species at all. So they were climbing out of the fence, but they weren't surviving. We even released some outside the fence and they weren't surviving. So um, you know, there are examples of halo effects, mostly in birds in New Zealand, where they've emigrated out into the suburbs. So, you know, that sort of gives us hope that we can get to that point. But when you look at the um, examples in Australia, we really don't have good examples of halo effects here. These are the only two halo effects that we did detect. These are two native mice that are just naturally found inside the reserve, and they've increased since we got rid of the cats and foxes. And the dotted line is the fence. So high numbers on the left, and you can see a small halo effect that extends out only a couple of hundred metres for the plains mouse uh, and maybe, you know, a kilometre or so for the, for the hopping mice. So, you know, the, the, there is hope that we can get there, but it's, it's very difficult to, to prove that it's going to work. So in terms of a vision for fenced reserves, I think it's really great to have these conversations and it would be great to have them at a national level as well. Like where do we want to go to with these fenced reserves? So in my opinion, we want large naturally functioning areas where natural processes can be maintained and animals can continue to evolve and adapt. Um, and in order to do that, I think if you want to have an effective fenced reserve in that vein, there's a few things you need to think about. So. Firstly, you want to make sure that you get a fence that's been tested or test your own fence. Um, and there are fences that have been tested and two of the main ones have this um, curved top on them. The one in New Zealand has a, has a fixed top and the one in South Australia has a floppy top, but they both have that same curved design. There may well be better fence designs out there, but I think if you know, either need to test one yourself or, or use some existing fence designs that you know are going to work. And you really need to, to implement an effective incursion plan because you will get feral animals getting in at some point uh, through a hole in the fence or over the fence or, and you need to be ready. You need to have a plan in place because uh, Peron, Peron, Paris and Prong in WA had a fox get in and within three months it wiped out, you know, almost wiped out their entire bandicoot population. So things can happen very fast and go wrong very quickly. I personally feel that you should remove all feral, feral herbivores, so rabbits and goats and that sort of thing, and really be careful of macropods because macropods are particularly bad for overpopulation. They have a very fast growth rate. They're not able to self-release very easily compared to other species and um, do seem to have issues with overpopulation in that particular group of animals as well. Also need to really, if you want to maintain or improve animals' ability to adapt to climate change or other threats, you need to have big reserves. You need to have natural population fluctuations. And arid recovery animals during drought decline, but then they bounce back again. And, and that's what you want to see. You want to see a natural fluctuations in population that, that don't lead to overpopulation or, or catastrophic decline. 
And really part of that is about limiting your supplementary water and food. If, if you're providing supplementary water and food, you're probably setting yourself up for overpopulation because you're sustaining those populations at a level higher than they would naturally be there. And this is a really difficult issue with fence reserves, particularly small fence reserves, because sitting there and letting animals die during a drought is not something people want to do and there's animal welfare issues. And so I think this is a, a topic that needs a lot more discussion around Australia and, and how we're going to solve this because if you keep adding food and water at, at, you know, in large amounts, you're basically creating a zoo situation and then your ecosystem starts to decline in its, in its um, condition. Uh, and if you want to restore ecosystem function and have a functioning ecosystem, you've got to make sure all of your trophic groups are represented. So you want to make sure you've got your predators, your competitors, your detritivores, your scavengers. You want to really try and get animals from a wide range of those trophic levels. Um, and you also think about your order of reintroduction. So you want to get your ecosystem engineers in first. They're going to dig your holes that your stick nest rats can shelter in in summer. They're going to sort, turn the soil over and increase your, your vegetation recovery, that sort of thing. So thinking about what order you're going to put animals in is, is really important. And don't forget what's already there. And in some cases, when people talk to me about whether they want to put a fenced reserve in, they've already got a pretty special species there. And so you don't necessarily need to reintroduce things. You can just protect what you've already got. Um, a lot of the native species are going to respond amazingly from removing cats and foxes. Um, so you don't necessarily have to add anything else to the equation. You can just protect what you've already got through fenced reserves as well. And this we touched on, touched on before about dispersal, not only within the reserves, so about having a large enough reserve to allow young animals to disperse freely and not sort of get stuck in the home ranges of their parents, but also having leaky fences that allow them to, to get out as well and hopefully survive outside the fence if you can get your predator control down long enough. So make sure you put reserves where you can expand out or if you can get a halo effect to work. You know, if they're surrounded by agricultural land, then it's going to be it's going to be difficult. And lastly, choose wisely. So fence reserves are certainly suited better to some species and some areas. Smaller species definitely, so you can get that viable population size up. People talk about 500, it's a bit of a magic number, but you certainly want to have you know, large numbers if you can to allow that fluctuation. You want species that can get out through your fence, you're going to have a lot less issues with um, overpopulation if they can self-disperse. Large areas, Rainfall is a big one. Wherever you have hilly areas or areas with high rainfall, you have creek lines and drainage lines and they're very difficult to fence. You're going to have huge issues with incursions every time you get a rainfall event. Some work they did in New Zealand found uh, incursions happen can happen within 30 minutes of getting a hole in the fence. So things can happen pretty quickly and go downhill pretty quickly. Um, and yeah, be careful of macropods and um, because of that long-term maintenance issue and fence replacement issue, you really need to have that long-term funding secured before you start. So thank you very much for listening. Thank you, Catherine. That was fantastic. I had such a wonderful time working with you in Roxby at Arab Recovery. It was so amazing to be witness to the return of bilbies and betons and stick nest rats. But oh my goodness, that damage to the native plums there was something. Um, thank you. Um, I just want to remind our listeners that if they have a question to type it into our Q&A, that would be lovely. And now we'll come to questions at the end um, other than those that are being asked. So now I would like to welcome Adrian Manning. So Adrian is a professor uh, in ecology at the Venice School for, of Environment and Society at the Australian National University in Canberra. And Adrian and I, and I worked together at Mulligan's Flat Woodland Sanctuary in the ACT, where we did a project on the role of betong digs in turning over soil and ultimately the role of digging marsupials in restoring ecosystems. Welcome, Adrian. Thanks, Nikki. share my screen there. Um, so uh, I'm going to talk about um, Mulligan's Flat Woodland Sanctuary, um, which didn't start out as a fence sanctuary, but had been reserved 
as a result of the community um, campaigning for um, a nature reserve. <clears throat> and we were asked in, in the first instance to come in and do some research on the ecosystem, the way to improve the ecosystem. And then the whole project snowballed to the point where we built a, a, a predator-proof fence, a sanctuary, and then that allowed us to do reintroductions and so forth. So Mulligan's Flat is in the north of uh, the ACT. It's um, largely what's called critically uh, endangered box gum grassy woodland. We've got about, um, it's about 1,600 hectares and we've got 1,200 hectares in predator-proof sanctuaries. The original sanctuary that everyone knows is the 485 hectares uh, around Mulligan's Flat. So we've had a partnership there for about 16 years, starting with the Mulligan's Flat Guriru Woodland Experiment. And then uh, they developed the idea of a predator-proof sanctuary uh, and an independent trust that works with us and the government. And we've also been, we learned from uh, Arid Recovery and visited Catherine and the team over there back in 2006, and also Zealandia in, uh, in Wellington that sort of informed our thinking about how we would create our sanctuary. And more recently collaborating with, with Odinata. Um, and one of the key things about sanctuaries is, uh, I think they're as much about people as they are about animals and nature. And it's about the relationship of people um, <clears throat> and their local place. Uh, and it's really important that people feel a connection and are involved in, in sanctuaries. And we see um, Mulligan's Flat, a lot like Arid Recovery, about restoring the ecosystem, but also learning as we do this and then inspiring others. And if you if we think about sanctuaries in Australia, places like Arid Recovery inspired us to create a sanctuary at Mulligan's Flat. And now we're involved in creating sanctuaries elsewhere. So it is really a catalytic um, a process of creating and supporting sanctuaries and learning from each other. <clears throat> So when we think about where, where does Mulligan's Flat sit, we kind of see ourselves in, in, in the center of a, a, a continuum from the, the, the large open wilderness areas and more conventional zoos and open range. We are animals live essentially as wild in Mulligan's Flat. And it's really a place where we are, in terms of reintroducing species, rebuilding populations of its in situ species, hopefully improving conditions. And as, uh, as Catherine mentioned, was talking about, they're actually a stepping stone um, back out into the wild beyond, beyond the fence, as we sometimes call it. Um, and of course, beyond the fence is really challenging and there's a lot of work to be done there. So sanctuaries uh, sit in that place between captive populations and refuge populations where we rebuild, we learn, we train animals so that ultimately we can, we can get them out, out there, back it back. Uh, beyond the fence. <clears throat> now, one of the uh, key things that we think about when we're thinking of Mulligan's Flat, we 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 think about the loss of species in the ecosystem, and this is something. This causes something called shifting baseline syndrome, which basically comes from fishery science. And this is the idea that our benchmark for the environmental quality is based on how the environment was when we grew up or when we were young and we were learning. And this example here from fishery science. Uh, when populations are good, fishery scientists benchmark good populations. So if you're a fishery science here in the North Atlantic looking at cod, this would be a benchmark. If you're a fishery science in the 2000s, your benchmark would be different. And it's the same thing in ecosystems. So um, if you, uh, we have our own shifting baseline uh, in places like Mulligan's Flat, where we've lost species since the 18, 1800s. And our idea is how can thinking about how we can reverse that shifting baseline. And as Catherine was talking about rebuilding the trophic relationships, the food webs, we think about Mulligan's Flat as a food web. And we're, we're putting animals back into that food web to, make, to improve the function. And also managing the, uh, the existing in situ vegetation and, and species as well as part of that. So in our original experiment, pre-fence, we worked with the ACT government to look at ways of improving the woodlands. We added 2000 tons of dead wood. Um, we burned some areas uh, with controlled burns with the help of the ACT government. 
We controlled kangaroos with uh, exclusion fences. So we had kangaroos in some places and not in others. So we could look at that, that effect. And then over the last 16 years, we followed the ecosystem and the response of the ecosystem to the different treatments. Now, as we built the partnership with government, we started to think about building predator-proof fence. And that's where Mulligan's Flat Woodland Sanctuary, the idea of Mulligan's Flat. And you might see that fence is a bit familiar because it's essentially the fence from our recovery adapted to a woodland setting. So there's an example of how we, how we learned. We built that fence in 2009. And what that allowed us to do then was to think about reintroducing species that couldn't otherwise uh, come back. And we've been, uh, since 2009, been experimentally reintroducing species to Mulligan's Flat. And also Mulligan's Flat is a great place to take people, um, decision makers and show them what's possible and not just talk about Mulligan's Flat, but talk about sanctuaries around Australia and talk about conservation. And when we're uh, doing our uh, reintroductions, we, we, look at, we look at what we do as, as different tactics for success. And we try different tactics, ones focus on animals, on the animals themselves, the genetics, um, the behavior, and also the environment, how can we manipulate the environment? We try things, if things don't work, we try something else. And that's the way we try to think an adaptive approach to our reintroductions. So with the um, Eastern Betong, um, we, uh, when we started, we didn't know exactly which Betong uh, was um, in our area, but what we do know is they were highly abundant. So you couldn't plant potatoes in the district around Mulligan's Flat because uh, Betongs were so abundant and you can imagine the turning over the soil the size of that process that would have been there so once we'd identified the eastern betong which luckily for us was still in tasmania we um, um we brought it back from tasmania and uh, we didn't want to just bring the animal back but we wanted to bring the processes that were associated with it so we started an adaptive process after identifying the betong and it took us three years from that point to actually reintroducing them into Mulligan's Flat. And there's a lot of trial and error in that uh, as there are in the, other, in the other sanctuaries. And then once we've reintroduced the Betong, we've had a program of monitoring the population, how things have changed through time as the population is built, and also the impact on the ecosystem. Um, and including the work that Nikki was talking about that we collaborated on looking at that lost ecosystem process that the Betongs brought back. And then building on our learning from the Eastern Betong, we've gone on to reintroducing species like the Eastern Quoll. Uh, and and um, second from the left is Belinda Wilson, who is our PhD student who's worked on the reintroduction of uh, the e Eastern uh, Quoll. Now I was mentioning our tactical framework, and this is how we improve success at Mulligan's Flat. And in the first instance, when we first released the Eastern Quoll, we brought 16 animals in, uh, eight captive animals um, from Mount Rothwell and eight, eight wild animals from Tasmania. And in that first season, we brought uh, males and females in pre-breeding and we only had 50% survival. And this was because the males fought with each other and went over the fence and some were predated by foxes. So we, we, we looked at what happened there and we thought, well, what can we change to improve it? So the following year, we brought only females in with pouch young, uh, we didn't bring any males in and we brought them after the breeding season. So when they were no longer um, fighting and there was um, um, arguments between animals and the result of that shit, just one change in tactic was 92% survival. So from 50% to 92% just by changing tactics. And in the third year, similar sort of rate. So that's how we do this learning process that improves the quals. And now the, the quals are doing very well in Mulligan's flat um based on that those initial tactical uh, changes that we made now we're also working on other species such as new holland mice and eastern chestnut mice the interesting thing about these species is they disappeared so long ago that we didn't even know we'd lost them until colleagues uh, like um, fred ford looked at the um the deposits in caves and realized that these were actually widespread through woodlands west of the dividing range, but they, they had completely gone and they went very early, earlier than quals and betongs. So we've been looking at bringing them from their refuges, in this case, the New Holland mouse, 
doing trials at Mulligan's flat, looking at different ways, leaky fences and different, idea, different ideas to help us get them back firstly in sanctuaries and then in the long term thinking beyond the fence. Now, as part of the development of Mulligan's flat, um, the, the uh, partnership has continued to develop uh, and we've recently put together a strategy that takes into account everything that we've, we've learned and our learning and how we are building and thinking about the future. So we've got a strategy taking us to 2045. And in that strategy, we're starting to think about new species that we might consider reintroducing or at least conducting pilot research that would then inform restoration in other places in our region and around Australia. And uh, uh, Catherine's mentioned um, Zealandia in, in um, New Zealand. They are starting to get stink beyond the fence there where animals, uh, birds have spilled out into the neighboring suburbs and they've really inspired the people living around the area of uh, Zealandia. Kaka and other birds are going there and people are starting to do pest control in suburbs uh, to support uh, the species. And of course, um, uh, Catherine's talked about all their work, which inspires us to think about beyond the fence in our setting as well. And we've got our own pioneer at, uh, at Mulligan's Flat, Phil the Bushstone Curlew. He's got a GPS backpack on. Uh, uh, we've got a PhD student, Shoshana Rapley, who's Develop the means of putting GPS backpacks on bushstone curlews. And now Phil and his uh, fellow bushstone curlews go and spend time. This is New South Wales, just over the border, pops over the border, has a little bit of a look around, comes back to Mulligan's Flat. So they're doing it themselves, exploring, learning. There are foxes in this, in this landscape beyond Mulligan's Flat, and they are learning about foxes, and then they can come back into Mulligan's Flat. So it's as, it, as the idea that it's a it's a, a stepping stone or a safe haven for them where they can explore beyond the fence. And we've also done some pilot work with Eastern Bedongs, looking at ways in which uh, Bedongs can survive beyond the fence, building those stepping stones to the point where perhaps one day we can have Bedongs throughout the landscape if we can develop the tactics and the techniques necessary. So based on what we've done at Mulligan's Flat, we am working with the trust we, uh, we do a lot of science communication about, um, about what we do and how we learn and importantly, giving people opportunities like twilight tours to, to go out and experience nature for themselves. And that is a really important part of how we, our philosophy at Mulligan's Flat is that there are many different ways of experiencing Mulligan's Flat and getting a sense of what it would have been like to, to walk through these woodlands, say 150 years ago. So getting everyone's individual shifted baseline back up a higher baseline then we then we think about the people x are expecting more they can either go back to um other places in canberra or around the country and say why can't we have this here and this is the way we want people to think think about um nature and restoration so uh the, the woodlands and wetlands trust has an, an amazing uh, science communication program in, uh, we we've had um hand raised betongs for, to take into schools to show them with, with uh, so children, we have uh, media coverage. And in fact, this story here, recent story about echidna trains uh, in Mulligan's flat had 6 million views. So that's been seen all over the world, talking about Australian conservation um, and telling the story of restoration. Um, and one of the things, this is one, uh, when we first brought betongs back from uh, Tasmania, this is at our at Tidbinbilla Nature Reserve where we had an insurance population. We had a, um, this is our first young betong. We were very excited about this when it first happened, the first pouch young that had emerged. And um, the staff down there called him Stuart Little. He was really a, a real, real character. And we realized then that the power of an animal like a betong to encapsulate the whole idea about the restoration of the ecosystem. And also um, with, here's our quals. This is just after the release of the quals. Um, and we put this uh, bit of footage on social media and got a lot of views on social media. And you can see the power of being able to engage people and show them something that they would not otherwise have seen. 
Um, and these, these Eastern quolls um, got a lot of attention in this video, got a lot of attention showing you what our native fauna look like when they're, when they're out there. You wouldn't otherwise see them. And then um, the um, taking everything that we've, um, we've been building through Mulligan since 2004, 2005, the next stage was we were, we were thinking about, well, how do we continue to build um, that experience and that engagement with the community? And, and our next step, um, working with Odenata, who we've been collaborating with on conservation projects, but now thinking about having a meeting place where people can come and find out about the research, not just at Mulligan's Flat, but all other sites, um, such as Mount Rothwell and the other sites around the country. So our next step in our journey, if you like, at Mulligan's Flat is the construction of the Woodland Learning Centre, which is, is, um, is almost complete now. And this is a place where ourselves, the researchers, the managers in the park service and the trust will we will we'll work there together and the community will be able to come and hear talks about um, about what we do in Mulligan's flat. This will be the point where people will take night walks and um, we will also have lectures for students from university we will host media events. There'll be some opportunities to meet um, some of the fauna um, there. And really, uh, we're thinking about how we can um, really engage people um, in any way possible to tell them the story and, and think about, show them how we can raise that shifting baseline. And we're now at the point where, as I say, we're, we're almost complete and we will have a home where we can tell our story about Mulligan's Flat. And this will be where we will build um, <clears throat> in the, uh, the extended sanctuary, which is Guru Ryu. Guru Yaru next door to Mulligan's Flat, which is our next 800 hectare um, sanctuary. And as you saw at Arid Recovery, once you start with one sanctuary, you can build, you can make them bigger. And that's what makes it possible for you to do more things, have bigger populations and experiment with new ways of improving the ecosystem. And that's our story so far. Thank you, Nikki. Thank you so much, Adrian. It really gets me thinking that when we go into national parks, I often look at them and wonder what they would be like 200 years ago and just how different they would be. And I really love your thoughts of that projects like Arid Recovery and Mulligan's Flat are stepping stones to other projects, um, which then multiply across the country. And for everybody listening, Adrian himself has gone on to work on other projects and to expand and has done a fair bit of work with our next guests. So I would now like to welcome Annette Lepalski and Sam Marwood. So Annette is the Biodiversity Director of Mount, at Mount Rothwell Reserve near Geelong, which is currently the largest predator-free reserve in Victoria. Uh, Mount Rothwell is part of Odonata, an organisation with innovative ideas and practice around integrating conservation and production. Mount Rothwell has been instrumental in protecting some of Victoria's most threatened species and it networks closely with uh, various zoos in managing the small populations of our threatened species. And Sam is the CEO of Odinata, and he spent many years trying to change the way we do business um, in Australian agriculture, including supporting new young farmers to get onto the land. And I'll let him introduce his latest scheme. So welcome, Annette and Sam. Thanks, Nikki, for the lovely introduction, and thanks to Trust for Nature for having us as guest speakers. Um, this is going to be fun because um, I'll be talking for the first part of it and uh, Sam will be driving the presentation. So we'll see how in sync we are with um, whether he can get my social cues on the next slide. But um, Sam will talk after me and, <laughs> and we'll go from there. So um, yeah, as, as Nikki mentioned, uh, yeah, we've, we've been working, uh, yeah, well, I've, I've personally been working with um, Mount Rothwell for since 2003. So I was technically employed by um, John Wormsley, 
back in the day with Earth Sanctuaries when that was first started. So, um, and then transitioned into um, Mount Rothwell and Odonata. Um, so a long, long history and nice long journey with um, Mount Rothwell, which has been wonderful. Um, and of course, we, we held the longest record for um, being Victoria's largest fenced sanctuary until we broke our own record just recently uh, with our sister property, Tiverton, which is now twice the size of Mount Rothwell and um, has Eastern Mud Bandicoots freely running around the place, which is really cool, which I'll talk about a little bit later. Um, so, well, that was my first slide anyway. <laughs> we'll uh, move to the next one. You're failing, Sam, already. <laughs> there is a delay, it looks like. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, so, so Mount Rothwell is 480 hectares in size. Um, and we've, uh, yeah, held it for, for about 18 years, that record. Um, but we've been constructing, you know, we, we started fencing the area and eliminating the pests and reintroducing the, the native animals, you know, 21 years ago. So really long history in, in um, reconstructing that ecosystem. Um, because we did adopt the sanctuary from, from Earth Sanctuaries back in the day, uh, there was quite a bit of work that had to go into cleaning the area up. So we had to remove non-endemic species and, um, you know, basically rescue some of the genetics in, in some of the remnant populations there. So, so there was a little bit of work in, in cleaning up uh, the animals that we had and prioritising what we focus on. Um, but we, we're sort of on track and we think we've got a really good model going forward. Um, so I'll go through all of those. But the exciting uh, thing for me, I think, has just been watching all the interactions. You know, we've had a high a density of, of animals within a small space. So, you know, when we're looking at the populations, um, yeah, we're talking thousands of animals within the 480 hectares. Um, and they tend to go through a boom and bust sort of cycle annually. Um, so it's interesting watching such, you know, diverse species uh, interacting once again for the first time in, you know, over a hundred years for some. So next. So uh, some of the key species that we've been working on, um, we introduced Eastern quolls in 2002 and we started a, a captive breeding program and Back then it was, it was quite difficult to, to source quolls. And so we, I think we slipped them through South Australia and crossed the border into Victoria. And um, we, we tried our hardest to, to you know, maintain the genetics there. We knew that was a critical um, management action to, to ensure the population you know, is successful into the future. Um, but it wasn't until really 2009 that we actually sourced new genetics and we developed the markers and started producing um, a genetic management program around eastern quolls um, and of course we we partnered up with mulligan's flat and um, developed the, the program even further and allowed us to um, source unique genetics from the wild but also um, allowed us to exchange our animals across both sanctuaries which is exciting and um, has obviously had a wonderful impact i know uh, when we first started with eastern quolls we only had four animals and we imported black uh, quolls. They're, they're sort of a, um, a throwback on, on the gene. And so you get about 10% which are black. We tried for years and years to have black offspring and they never bred black offspring in captivity. And um, as soon as we introduced them into the, into the free range sanctuary, we started seeing black quolls running around. So um, that's a real obvious indicator of uh, genetic diversity. Um, so as once we started introducing new genetics into the captive program, we started seeing black offspring. So we knew that was a, a good, yeah, great indicator. Um, and the Eastern Bard, Bard Bandicoot is, is, of course, <laughs> you can see it all in the media lately. Uh, the population has been booming. Uh, so we sourced 24 quolls from the program in 2004, um, and they were on the increase since then. We've maintained... Uh, the most genetically diverse population on the mainland for the longest period. Um, and our numbers peaked in 2012 to about 1,200. And they've been fluctuating over the seasons um, from about 700 to about 1,500. 
Uh, at the moment, they're probably booming to our highest numbers. So I wouldn't be surprised if they're over 1,500 just at Mount Rothwell alone. Um, there was uh, a, a real sign that the genetics were, were failing on them. So we were starting to see a few faults within their populations. You've, you've got to remember they were thought to be extinct and rediscovered in the tip in Hamilton. Uh, there was, I think, 63 uh, there and about 40 or so were harvested, uh, 19 genetically represented, and these established the captive breeding program for the next 30 years. So um, we needed to increase genetic diversity into the population. That's where we started working with Melbourne University, and uh, they basically genotyped everything and worked out how to increase uh, the diversity in the population. That was by bringing in their cousins from Tasmania, which was an interesting experiment. You know, I think it's only happened three times in Australia. Uh, so it was in mountain pygmy possums, uh, rock wallabies, the southern brush tail rock wallabies, and now the eastern barred bandicoots. Um, and I think only four times in the world that this had happened. So two, two so there's subspecies that have been isolated for almost 20,000 years. We weren't really sure what we were getting <laughs> into. Um, the Tasmanian uh, animals were about twice as big as the Victorians. And uh, when they bred, they bred successful young and fit and healthy young. Great um, diversity amongst the morphometrics. So looking at the ear sizes and the coloration and and also, uh, yeah, equal sex ratio. So that's all good indicators of these animals being fit and healthy and feistier. They bred really efficiently um, and they didn't show any of the faults that we had seen on the mainland population. So real positive story there. And uh, to top that off, we uh, introduced 40 just last spring into Tiverton. Uh, so Tiverton is now Victoria's largest fence sanctuary and that site will support Ease, I'm pretty sure to easily support 3,000 animals. So um, for a program that's been running for 40 years, potentially supporting, yeah, four four and a half thousand animals uh, is really exciting from the original 60 that were discovered um, way back when. So we're super excited to be part of that one. Um, Southern brush tail rock wallaby is also another outcrossed animal. So we're hybridised, we're outcrossing them with uh, central brush tail rock wallabies. And again, you know, quite a low um, founder size in the captive program. Um, so we are increasing genetics and managing them for that reason. Um, as Catherine touched on, macropods can be really interesting um, in a fenced reserve. And our advice is always, again, if you, if you do get involved with a macropod breeding program, you need to have a plan, an overflow plan. So rock wallabies are a brilliant animal where you know, there are some in the wild and, and we can play that role in supplementing them or at least building the numbers up high enough to do a mass release. So there is that opportunity to overflow into the wild um, and, and that is um, the, the plans for the recovery of the rock wallaby. Uh, we are setting up a, a new site with, with our partners as well in, in Avenal and uh, that's a new and upcoming rock wallaby site which will potentially support over 200 animals and that will effectively double the size um, in the first stage, that is, in uh, the second and third stage, we might get them up to about 5,000 individuals. Um, so another species that we have the potential to downlist and um, making having great success with in that species recovery. Um, Bushstone curlew, uh, Adrian mentioned in his presentation. So we're uh, probably a little over successful in the captive breeding on this one. Uh, we've currently got or nearly about 45 and they're breeding really early. So we're expecting about 60 or so by the end of summer, um, which is exciting. And uh, we get to overflow these guys. So uh, hopefully we'll be looking at a release in the ACT soon. Um, so very exciting to be tracking those and learning more about them. And eventually, or ideally we'd love to get them back in Victoria and, and learn about um, whether we can reestablish them beyond our fences. Uh, the Eastern Betong uh, is, a, is another partnered program with Mulligan Splat and uh, Adrian. And we, have, we were part of the uh, rescue program from um, the ACT fires that occurred in, in the Brindabella Ranges. And we uh, yeah, ended up moving um, quite a few Betongs from, from the ACT just before the, the areas got burnt. Um, so they, they have 
been introduced into our woodland and are happily hopping around, finding their mates. But it's a very early days since um, they've only been there in the last year or so. Um, and southern brown bandicoots, of course, um, they're a, probably an underrated little animal. They're, uh, they have been upgraded to, to endangered from, from threatened. And we've, been, we've had them hopping around and we're about to develop that program a little bit further and learn more about them. These species all play important ecological roles. So we're sort of seeing them as priority species for recovery and certainly something that, that we think we can contribute to. Uh, this is a little video. So this is uh, an idea of some of the interactions that occur in summer around a very popular waterhole. Uh, so you've got everything from swamp wallabies, betongs, quolls. So that's an eastern quoll there. This is a big thumper of a spot tail quoll. Um, so we have reintroduced a number of different species. Um, yeah, there's uh, swampies there and eastern greys and a possum. But uh, I think there's a little eastern barred bandicoot somewhere that runs up. So you can see they're all quite civil around a waterhole. Um, but they all run away when that spot tail quoll comes over. So they're pretty clever in doing that. And that's quite an important uh, behavior trait there, you know, that they they know who to look out for, they know how to hide from danger. And um, that's exactly what we wanted them to learn when they're within the fence. And I suppose that's the um, distinction that, that I think we like to make, you know, captive breeding has a role and, um, Free rate uh, fenced sites are, are basically a stepping stone to get them back into the landscape. And so it's critical to teach those behaviours back into them. Um, at Mount Rothwell, we've got 16 um, birds of prey listed and the densities are, are through the roof. You know, it's, it's like an aerial show. Avalon Air Show has their own show. We've got our own show at Mount Rothwell. Um, there's constantly a, a bird of prey in the sky trying to hunt or predate or swoop on all of us. Um, and that does occur throughout the night with the with the owls or into dusk. So these guys uh, have a bit of pressure on them, and um, yeah, not only from the raptors but also from the from the quolls in the landscape. Um, Sam, oh, you there? Yep. <laughs> Okay, uh, so yeah, these are just some of the numbers uh, that I've mentioned through the programs. I think I've basically ran through most of those, but you're welcome to have a read through that. I won't read it all out because I think I'm hogging all the time. Um, but yeah, I guess our ultimate goal is, is to set up a strategic program for all of our species and, and uh, yeah, eventually get their genetics right, um, rewild them into fenced reserves and then overflow them into the wild where we can. Um, and along the way, hopefully pick up a, a bit of information that we can apply um, to ensure that any wild release is successful. But it is also holding that, um, you know, uh, pre preventing the extinction in the first place. So it is just a temporary hold site. Um, I know there's, you know, at least three species that would be at least functionally extinct if we weren't directly involved in, in you know, a fence site or fencing them in. Um, so again, I probably have touched on going through um, all the individual species, but this is just some of the science that we sort of apply at, at Mount Rothwell. We work with, uh, you know, Australian National University with Adrian Manning and, and uh, Melbourne University, Andrew Weeks. Um, so we've got great advice. We, we certainly do. Um, we, we aren't the science people. <laughs> we, are, we take the advice. We like to apply the operations. Um, and so, yeah, we've, we've got the outcrossing program through Melbourne Uni for the Eastern Barred Bandicoots and Southern Brushed Rock Wallabies. Uh, we genetically manage, we have management programs for the Eastern Quoll, Bushstone Curlew, Eastern Betong. We're about to set up one for the East Rufus Betong, uh, Southern Brown Bandicoot, and also Long Nose Potteroo. Um, we have, an, our, our intent is to set up a metapopulation management program. So basically uh, we'll aim to set up as many fenced reserves as we can that are feasible to, for us to manage. Um, and then eventually overflow these animals into these sites and rotate them. And I guess the, the idea of that is just to make sure that if um, an event, a disastrous event occurs, you've got 
you know, other, other baskets with eggs in it. You don't put all your eggs in the one basket. Um, and, you know, that, that was something that really dawned on us when we did have those big bushfires. Uh, there's effectively, you know, real th three colonies of rock wallabies that exist and one's the East Gippsland, there was Captive Colony in Tibimbilla in the ACT and then there was Mount Rothwell and two of those were threatened by fire. Mount Rothwell was the last one standing. So there were, we, we were kind of a little bit terrified and uh, a little bit pressured by having, you know, potentially a fire um, threatening us would be in a lot of trouble. So important to set up more than one sanctuary for the, these animals. Um, we're also applying uh, environmental DNA, so eDNA, some of you may be familiar with. We've set up a program with, which Sam will talk more about, the Great Platypus Search. And this is uh, pretty much profiling these sites and gaining information, working out what animals are present or absent within that ecosystem. Um, and getting as much knowledge as we can just to make informed decisions into conservation. Um, and then uh, we do a lot of uh, monitoring and management. So all the on-ground action, observations over the 20 years, all our trapping remote sensor camera work, we use interesting lures. Um, and you've got to get really creative with some of these things to, to know what you're looking for and to influence uh, things. So we also use um, tracking collars and uh, thermal drones across our properties. It's a bit delayed, isn't it? <laughs> so uh, yeah, you can see some pictures there on the side of, of uh, yeah, some of the work that we do. Uh, so some of the difficulties that we, we come across uh, fence, fence maintenance, it's uh, a lot of fun. We do it daily. Uh, Mount Rothwell's fence is an ageing fence, had a 10-year lifespan and we've got it now to 21 years and it's certainly something that we're aiming to replace. Um, it's, it's a really important asset to these species, so it's critical for us to be replacing this. But you do get, you know, storms that impact your fence and kangaroos and deer and goats and all sorts of threats coming through. Um, sometimes even people cutting holes. So um, it's, it's pretty high risk. Uh, we have uh, obviously site management's always, you know, it gets a little bit tricky. Um, there's a lot of, you know, things that you've got to navigate from weeds to, um, you know, just maintaining your tracks and maintenance. Uh, population management, you've got to make sure, as I said, every population is going to grow without a predator present. So you've got to expect to have some management in place to navigate some of the overpopulation burdens. Uh, and then of course, the, the fun part, the licensing ethics and reporting, there's always a lot affiliated with that, but also necessary. <laughs> a little bit slow. <laughs> uh, so currently, yeah, Tiverton, our largest fence reserve in Victoria. Um, it, nothing compared to Catherine Mosby's site, but uh, we're pretty excited about it. Um, so yeah, it's a unique model. It uh, integrates farming and conservation. So uh, yeah, we, we're applying uh, strategic grazing across the site. So effectively what you do is you, you crash graze an area in spring when all your weeds come up and uh, that allows your natives to, to come over summer and you're, you're controlling your weeds in your area, you're feeding your sheep, you get to make some money off your stock. Uh, we've actually won awards in uh, the wool, so they've got a higher, finer, higher tensile wool, something special about the wool, um, and, you know, because they're feeding on native pastures. So you've got great wool, you've got money coming from having sheep on your property and you've got bandicoots running around the place uh, and we will introduce eastern quolls to the site. So this site did have a large population of east, eastern quolls. So we're really looking forward to see what interactions will occur. Will they be feeding on the sheep's afterbirth? Will, be, will they be lining their nests with this high tensile wool? They'll be very spoiled uh, quolls. So we're, and they'll be living in the rock walls apparently. So which we have plenty of. So we're really excited to see how that pans out. So we'll, uh, yeah, we'll just probably, I think I've, I'm running out of time, so we might have to get up and be hogging, hogging Sam's time in this. 
I think that's why he's delaying the slides. Where are you up to? You're up to Odin Outer Innovation? Yeah, no, you can we've you can skip through this one. Here we go. Yep, that's the one. Uh, so some of our, our uh, innovative applications, we've uh, we use conservation dogs and they hunt our rabbits or tell us where the rabbits are and then we remove them. Um, they learn to navigate their way around native animals so they know all the native animals um they'll wait at a hole tell us there's a rabbit in there and wait for the quoll the bandicoot and the betong to jump out before they catch the rabbit for us um, we've trained a dingo to find fox poo and we use this fox poo uh, we sent it to melbourne uni and they profile it for us and we know who's left in the sanctuary and we can stalk it and hunt it down and the dingo helps us find them um, and we've been um yeah pretty much involved in a lot of rescues and and returns so we've had to get a little bit we're quite reactive in in thing in you know events that that need action quite quickly um so we can really you know pack up some things and get things ready and move things shift things around so we can predict or prepare for for any future um rescues we have a plane which is kind of cool our neighbor has a plane <laughs> it's, not, it's not that plane though, is it? <laughs> it is. Oh, not that plane. No, no, no. No, that's the ATF did the great rescue there. Um, right. So this is, uh, is this you, Sam, or is this me? This is your last one and then I'll jump in. My last one. So, so this is, um, I guess, our map, our map into the future. So where I was talking about the meta population plan, um, our intent is to set up all these sanctuary sites. And so far, we've got these penciled in. Um, so uh, yeah, you can see where Mount Rothwell is in Tiverton. Uh, those ones are established, which was getting well, just about fenced now. We're starting pest eradication. Mulligan's Royal established, our sister, our, our partners. Um, we have Sunland, which is a, a wetland area for turtles. Arana Park, which or around a sanctuary, which will be our Bushstone Curlew site and the Grampians and the Stony Risers. So we've got a, quite a few coming online and it's quite exciting to have these dotted across the landscape. And our intent will be to roll these out right across the um, southeast coast of Australia, which I assume Sam will be talking a bit more about. So I'll pass it over to him. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Annette, uh, that is brilliant. So, so Sam Marwood, I'm CEO of Odonata, and uh, I get to support and get around Annette and, and Andrew Weeks and Adrian Manning and support them in their great work with our sanctuaries and expanding network of sanctuaries. And so I just want to talk about the momentum we've built as an organisation and centred around Mount Rothwell and Nigel Sharp, who's the founder of Odonata and the owner of Mount Rothwell. He's been doing this for, for 18 years and working with Annette on that. And you know, I feel like I've had the privilege to come in and, and see this amazing work and, and support support uh, helping to end the extinction of, of key threatened species uh, in Australia. And so we've built this momentum, you know, Odonata has only been around for about five years um, and we've built this momentum and we've realised the model of supporting private landholders to be part of the threatened species solution is, is really empowering. And a lot of landholders are coming to us now, uh, you know, a bit like Nigel Sharp was and, and other landholders um, who, who were mentioned here today already. Um, and I know there's some actually watching who are part of our, our potentially expanded network of sanctuaries, but there are landholders out there who love the idea of being part of any extinction and maybe having a sanctuary. And I'll talk about how we are sitting back and thinking about, well, where are the sanctuaries that we need? What are the species we want to focus on? Now that we've, we've got some lessons under our belt, with these sanctuaries and we know we can support others but we want to do it cautiously and we want to do it with people fully fully aware of the difficulties you know that Catherine's been through as well highlighting but also the excitement and uh, the revenue you need to be able to keep these things going so I'll talk through that very quickly to say how we are trying to expand and build on on the work that's, that's happened in the past the key point here is around business models. We feel that is the strength that we have as Odonata. We're here to encourage landholders, entrepreneurs, and find different ways to bring in revenue to fund conservation, particularly around these sanctuaries. So farming, as Annette went through their activity in sanctuary, how you can integrate that into the business operation to fund these sanctuaries. Tourism offsets. And we are continually exploring, I'll outline how we're encouraging those, those entrepreneurs to come up with those business ideas. 
but we do have a lot of um, landholders come to us. And so that's made us sit back and think about, well, what do we really want to do here? And, and so we've created it over the last year or so, our vision is Odonata uh, around threatened species. And this is our vision that we've crafted around what we want to do by 2050, have Australia's once threatened species thriving outside the fence in healthy and productive landscapes. You know, that's, that's the thing that gets up at us up in the morning to keep fighting for what we're doing. And we believe our role is not to do this ourselves necessarily, but to have our core research properties, but use that to empower others, other Australians to get on and, and save threatened species. So to do that, we've got these four pillars of which the sanctuaries are, are one of them. Our first is around research. So we've been working with Andrew Weeks, who's been amazing with our research uh, around genetics with our threatened species, but he's an expert in this environmental DNA that, uh, again, Annette, uh, Annette talked about before. But we're rolling out uh, the great Australian platypus search at the moment, which focused in Victoria, but expanding across Australia to take water samples to understand where our wildlife are. It's going to be the most comprehensive uh, uh, wildlife survey in Australia, maybe the world, very definitely the, one of the largest citizen science projects. And I'll touch on that in a second. But through these pillars, we want to have a comprehensive understanding of where our wildlife are through this eDNA. We want to support sanctuaries. So the second pillar of our research, set up these sanctuaries and, and explore where the next sanctuaries could go or should go um, to boost the populations of threatened species. We want to, this third pillar, want to get in and support landscape scale projects that are out there already across Victoria and you know, everywhere, Western Australia, Gond <clears throat> Gondwana link. How do we get in and help plug holes? How do we use our business models and our sanctuaries to help fill those corridors so that we are getting the landscape ready for that time when we can finally get the animals outside the fence, you know, 10, 20, 30 years time. Um, and, the, and the fourth pillar of what we're doing is that outside the fence research. So getting behind Adrian and his great, great work to understand how do we ensure that, you know, we're not just building fences for fencing sake. We want to build it to build populations so that one day they'll be outside. And also uncovering business models, ideas, technical solutions that can really help our sanctuary landholders be more effective in, in their work. So those four pillars are sort of guide everything we're doing as Odonata. We want to have a comprehensive uh, approach to how we are going to be ending extinction and how we're empowering others and, and encouraging those with ideas, uh, entrepreneurs or landholders and saying, yep, you can do it. It'll be hard, but we're here to support you and help you think through and, and show how you fit into a strategic arrangement uh, of sanctuaries or of, of business ideas for, for supporting nature. So that, that sanctuary network is something that Annette has pointed out is a key, again, a key, key pillar of what we're doing. We do have those core research sanctuaries and now um, we're working with other current sanctuaries, but looking to understand who else out there is thinking about building a sanctuary on their land. Uh, and this does allow us, I think for the first time, definitely from our point of view, sit back, allow us to sit back and think about well, what are all the species we wanna support where are those land, um, sanctuaries that we want to have in the landscape to de-risk from bushfire and de-risk from disease uh, so that we have that network that we're and, and moving animals across and thinking about the meta population management. So we've established a mastermind program which kicked off about a month ago. We've had 70 landholders over the last year or two say to us, hey, they'd love to think about a sanctuary. And we're just a small organisation trying to figure out how do we share our knowledge more effectively. So this is a, a bit of an open call to anybody that if you are, have land and thinking about a sanctuary, we can you can jump into this program uh, and learn with other landholders and with us around what your sanctuary property could look like. Uh, and go through all the hardships, you know, we'll, we'll tell you all about the difficulties of setting up a sanctuary, but we want you to understand as landholder what that would be to have a sanctuary like this and allow you to sit back and think about where would your property sit in a strategic point of view. Sometimes, as again, as Catherine was saying, maybe you don't need a fence, uh, but you'll be working alongside other landholders, working through, you know, what, what is the best outcome for your property, for species and how you fit in the network. So that's been really an exciting, empowering thing to do. And again, once we uncover more of these landholders, we can sit back and, and really think strategically about where we need these sanctuaries in the landscape. And just to touch on these two other key projects I pointed out before, this is the Great Australian Platypus Search, which I touched on. So 2000 samples happening right now uh, with, uh, uh, we're working with, with Victorian government, WWF, uh, some philanthropists, uh, Environment Education Victoria, Water Watch. We've got so many supporters, 2040 out there trying to get the public to take samples. So there's 
1,600 samples already been taken, uh, get ready to go across uh, Victoria. So there's about 400 samples available right now if you jump on that website in Victoria uh, for you as a citizen science to go out there and, and uh, take a simple water sample. And in that, we can assess the wildlife uh, in, and particularly platypus. We've got a particular focus with platypus, but, but wildlife uh, within that area. So the data is going to be absolutely phenomenal uh, and will, again, help us, particularly around where we can put our sanctuaries. But this data is going to be available to Australians to help us think about where, where do we need to put our energy uh, and where are our species uh, across the landscape. And then wild idea. This is a, another thing you can jump on. If you do have those ideas around business and nature, that's what we love to support, particularly you know, to support our sanctuaries and our entrepreneurs out there, you know, landholders out there trying to do good for threatened species. So we've started a business incubator. Our fifth program is kicking off uh, in 2021, uh, 2022, sorry. But we are encouraging the next generation of entrepreneurs and getting them to say, well, how do you build a business that supports nature, uh, solve some wicked problems? So jump onto wildideaincubator.com if you're interested in that as well. But hopefully that's been interesting. Hopefully that is encouraging for you, particularly if you have been thinking about uh, getting involved in sanctuaries. They are hard work. They are awesome. They are hard work, but that is possible. And you know, collectively, we're inspired by the idea that we, uh, you know, you as private landholders, particularly, can be part of that bigger picture. And and let's all sit back and think about what do we want for Australia's landscape. Um, so I hope that was inspiring. I always love hearing from Annette and, and Adrian. It was great to hear from Catherine as well. And, and thank you, Trust for Nature, for pulling this together. Thank you, Sam. I cannot wait to see what you and Annette and Odonata do over the next couple of years. I want to reserve here in North East. We'll have to talk afterwards or something. <laughs> um, I love the way small individual landholders that there are so many people and we have them here in Trust for Nature that are really keen to do fantastic conservation works. And it's so exciting that there is a possibility for individual landholders to um, come to the table and maybe be part of a whole scheme about um, yeah, reintroductions. That is so exciting because so far, until now that hasn't really been possible for small landholders, I think. So very, very exciting. Um, and I'm so excited you're getting black eastern quolls. They are so cute. <laughs> I don't know why, but it's the black ones. It's just, uh, there's something about them, isn't there? <laughs> um, Trust for Nature is certainly interested as well in the role of fence reserves, not just me wanting one in the northeast so that I can play with quolls, but Trust for Nature is very interested in, in um, fence reserves. We're exploring some options at the moment. And we have in the Strathbogie Ranges, we have two um, quite small 10 hectare predator proof reserves um, where we hope to reintroduce bush stone curlers. But that's um, stay tuned for further developments in Trust for Nature and fence reserves. Now, some wonderful people have been writing in with some fantastic questions. Can I perhaps get all our panellists to, I don't know if you all need to turn your, your cameras on, but I'll ask a couple of questions. I'll start with, uh, so certainly our panellists, you can jump in and have a look at the Q&A section. There's a few questions there that might be pertinent to some of you more than others. So jump in and, and answer a few. Catherine's been answering quite a few, which is wonderful. Um, Catherine, I might direct this question at you. There was a question there about the role of fenced reserves in initiating other developments like this, other conservation developments in national parks. Now, I know um, traditionally reserves, fenced reserves, have been like to start with they were mostly philanthropic groups and sort of private groups and um, NGOs and such can you talk about the development at all and by all means please Adrian Annette and Sam jump in um, afterwards perhaps if you've got more to add but can you speak a little bit to that space of the development of, of some of the reserves that have happened in national parks and then after that, Catherine, I wonder whether you could even talk a little bit about your role, some of your other work outside the parks, outside fenced reserves, such as your work with the dingoes in Sturt National Park. 
Yeah, so you're right. They started off um, mostly philanthropic or small organisations and then you had sort of CSIRO got involved in Harrison Prong over in WA and then uh, Peron Peninsula, which was a WA government one. South Australia got involved with Venus Bay Peninsula, so more peninsulas and fenced reserves. But but New South Wales just recently with their Saving Our Species program um, sort of had three national parks that they've contracted out fenced reserves to. So one is Wild Deserts in Sturt National Park, which is UNSW, which I'm involved in. And there's two AWC ones at Pilbara and Mallee Cliffs. So the next step for New South Wales is they're going to do another four fenced reserves, but on their own national parks, and they're going to manage it themselves this time rather than contracting it out to, um, to other organisations. So it'd be really interesting to see. I think there's two, one near Coffs Harbour, um, there's two near the coast and there's one, uh, two further inland, one near Dubbo. So, yeah, certainly governments are starting to look at, at them, um, but at least in South Australia and WA, there's not a lot of government-run fence reserves. They often start and then sort of lose momentum as government funding cycles go through their normal, you know, three yearly um, things. So I think having that private organisation or partnership organisations. A lot of governments are partners in, in these organisations and I think that's really a great model for them. So they can be partners but they're not solely relying on them to, to, to manage the whole park. And in terms of the Sturt National Park one, so that is um, where we have two fenced exclosures that are 20 square kilometres each, so 2,000 hectares each, but we've actually put little wing fences between them and joined them to the dingo fence. So they're in the corner of the dingo fence uh, on the New South Wales, Queensland and South Australian border. And that's allowed us to fence off another 110 square kilometres in that corner. So the dog fence is not 100% cat and fox proof, um, but it's, it's a pretty good barrier and we're going to add some trapping and and so it will be sort of a halfway house between exclosures where there's no cats and foxes they'll move out into this training zone which is 100 square kilometers where there'll be low levels of cats and foxes and then they can filter out uh, further into the park from there. Thank you Catherine and for anybody who's interested Catherine's very involved as well with looking at dingoes as top water predators and, and potential ways to reduce cats and foxes without the fences. But that's a, a topic slightly for another day, but I'm sure Catherine would be very interested if, um, to talk with you afterwards if necessary. Um, Adrian, perhaps I can ask you the same question. You've been quite involved in the governance of Mulligan's Flat, which has got an interesting setup. Are you able to add to that conversation just a tiny bit about governance, um, pros and cons? Um, yeah, I mean, I think um, in the case of Mulligan's Flat, government deliberately chose to work with NGOs, the so universities and non-governmental side of things and set up a trust. So in this case, they they felt the best way to do it was to, to you know, bring us and, and the community in. So I think I think the most important thing in, in sanctuaries in Australia is that we do have diversity in the way that we do things, because it's one of the ways that we learn. If we did everything the same way, I'm not sure we'd have the same learning experience. So um, I think so, so the, the approach that Odenard is taking, working with landowners is one way, wholly run by government is another partnership and NGOs are another one. And I, I would I think we should do all of them and see see what works and what are the best models. I certainly think our model um, with an independent trust working with partners has really been great because each partner brings a different part to the partnership. And that's that's what's allowed us to achieve. I don't think any single part of our partnership could have achieved what you see at Mulligan's Flat. We It needed all three legs of the stool, if you like, to make it work for us. But... I think diversity is the way to go on these models. Thank you, Adrian. Um, we had a question earlier about um, most of the reserves that we've been talking about tonight have been primarily conserving our threatened mammals, which is certainly something that each of the reserves that we have discussed have mostly focused on and this 
this backs onto what I was saying in that little background bit where it's our mammal species that are the most threatened, and so they're the ones we really target mostly. But sometimes there can be key plants in fenced reserves. Um, I know we can have small plots all over the place, but I'm wondering whether anyone would like to speak about key plant changes. I know maybe, Adrian, this is one for you. I know that there's been a lot of research done in Mulligan's Flat on the changes to the vegetation due to the fence and, and such. I wondered if you could speak to that. Uh, yeah, so, um, you know, I think one of the themes tonight about sanctuaries is you've got to think about um, the, the, the changes that cascade, not just simply from putting animals together, but putting a fence in, in the landscape. And part of our original experiment was around managing that um, different levels of grazing. And you, what, what it's created in Mulligan's Flat is you get a kind of diversity of biomass that you or, or grasses and, and so forth that you wouldn't otherwise have. And we've been doing research on those differences. Um, so I think um, Mulligan's Flat and Guriaru have really benefited from the fact that we've just got a bit more control over what's going on in there now. Whether you could do that at large scale, I'm not so sure. But in our case, at a, a sanctuary right on the boundary of, uh, you know, a, a large city, it's for us. I think it, that that approach has worked by using fencing. Um, I think it's improved things. We're obviously also monitoring the impacts of betongs, for example, on on uh, early Nancys and other things, and and of course the work that you were involved in. So I think in our case. We've been able to sort of look at what those changes are and in um you know some of them some things go up some things go down that's exactly as you would expect when you start changing things in the system thank you adrian it's getting late um i think we might leave it there and so I thank everybody for their questions. If the panelists would like to have a look at any of the last questions um, and see if they can answer any of those, that would be wonderful. But I want to conclude that, first of all, it's very hard for us as a society and a government to accept some of the risks and some of the, the difficulties that have come up tonight around fence preserves. But I think one of the first failures is not attempting anything in the first place. And we really need to work at this and something that, you know, that story that Annette was talking about, about trying for so many years to get these species, you know, and they've got down to so few, that is so key to, you know, that's such a good example of conserving these species. And if we don't have our fence preserves and we don't work on that, that species would have been lost. And so without the hard work and the dedication of people like tonight's people, Catherine, Adrian, Sam and Annette, our extinction record would be a whole lot worse. And so I thank our four speakers for both the amazing work that they do for their um, and for bringing their incredible insights here to us today. And so thank you for speaking to us. I also want to thank our wonderful listeners for attending tonight. Um, I hope you enjoyed the lecture as much as I did. I certainly really, really enjoyed it. It was absolutely wonderful. And I hope you feel super inspired and to maybe do some work in this space. Now we have um, one or two more, it's a Trust for Nature, has one or two more events and uh, as part of the Nature Festival run by um, our Victorian Department of Environment, Bill. So check out the Nature Festival. I believe someone has put the particular events in the chat line. Um, they will at least, if not, if they haven't already. And so I encourage anybody who's interested of our listeners to check out the Nature Festival and attend any more of these events. And once again, thank you to both our guest speakers and our listeners. Thank you and good night, everybody. <laughs>